I'm curious how many people in here ha actually know the legend of the 47 Ronin. Does everyone in here know it? I see, yeah. <laughs> I see a few hands that aren't up. I'll go briefly over it. Basically, in the very earliest part of the 18th century in feudal Japan, um, a daimyo, which is a feudal lord in, in Japan, was uh, required to go to uh, the shogun's castle uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, service to the shogun and to prepare for uh, greeting the emperor. The emperor in those days mm -hmm. was uh, mostly uh, uh, symbolic. Uh, the, the shogun had the real power. And during his uh, stay there, he was uh, being educated in the ways of the court. He was sort of a country uh, person and he was educated in the ways of the court by a, a court official who legend has, a, uh, as we'll talk, mm -hmm. the facts around what happened aren't exactly clear because uh, there was censorship of this story for many years afterwards. But uh, the legend goes that he was insulted and he pulled his sword in the shogun's castle. And that was uh, uh, required uh, the ultimate penalty, which was death. So he was forced to commit seppuku, which is a ceremonial uh, suicide, and his lands and possessions were uh, repossessed by the shogun, and his samurai were spread out. Now, in that period of Japan, this, his samurai, which he had several hundred at the time, they um, were required to do something. They felt, uh, according to the uh, Bushido Code, they had to uh, restore their master's honor. And um, so many of them wanted to attack, but they would have been wiped out right away to get revenge on the official, the court official that forced this, uh, this uh, incident to happen. And once they uh, gathered, there was one, his chief retainer, his chief samurai named Oishi, who counseled, no, we're going to do what the shogun asks. The, the shogun disbanded. They were called ronin, which is, called, which is a word for masterless samurai. They spread out over Japan. They were um, disgraced because they did nothing uh, to avenge their master. They, uh, Oishi, who was the greatest of them and the leader of them, ended up drunk in the street and uh, uh, completely allowed himself to be basically debauched mm -hmm. in his reputation. And over, sometime over a year later, it turns out it was all a uh, ruse that they had planned to wait until no one was watching them, and 47 of them gathered together, and they attacked the official's um, house, took out his, uh, his own retainers, got him, took his head off, and took it to Oishi's grave at uh, Sengakuji mm -hmm. uh, Temple, and presented the head to the, his grave stone. And then, shortly after, committed seppuku. And that is the, that's what uh, created the legend. It was censored for years. In about 50 years afterwards, the kabuki plays mm -hmm. began. And then, uh, 75 years after, uh, a uh, written account of the incident was created. I think it's called the incident at Edo. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's known, it's Japan's greatest legend and uh, says everything. One of the uh, uh, tags on this story is to know uh, the 47 Ronin is to know Japan because of it talks about honor and loyalty and all of the things. During uh, World War II and previous to that, if you saw the Japanese soldiers always carried a sword around mm -hmm. with them, that was to remind them of the samurai and the Bushido code so that they would fight to the end for honor. And uh, Stan? Honor and loyalty. Yes, yeah. honor and loyalty. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK, good. <clears throat> now, I'm a third generation Japanese American. And you know, it's, this story is such an important part of Japanese history that any, any person of Japanese uh, origins, uh, if he knows anything about his history, knows the story of the 47 Ronin. I first heard about the story when I was in about the third grade. And you know, when Mike approached me about it, I was, I was a bit leery, you know, Gaijin, a white guy. 
uh, writing about this. So um, I asked him a couple of questions, and I was quite impressed at how much he knew about it. And once I was on board, you started sending me all this research. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and uh, when I was in Japan uh, the last time, uh, this was in 2010, and this is even before uh, Mike had approached me to do the 47 Ronin. I made it a point to visit Sengakuji where the uh, the the uh, the, the uh, 47 are interred, or not interred, but they're buried there. So all the reference shots of the um, the uh, the temple and everything, they're from my photographs. And it just was a happy coincidence that you know, I took all these reference shots, and I didn't realize that I'd have to use it a couple of years later. And like I said, it's such an important part of Japanese history that you know, I had to uh, go to, their, to the temple. And I was surprised that you know, there were a lot. There, it, was, it was crowded. And they sell incense there. And the air there was full of smoke from the incense because so many uh, Japanese national were there burning incense at, at, the, uh, at the grave site. So I was really surprised. Yeah, for, for myself, I had been told about this story in, um, mm -hmm. when I first started my business by uh, Randy Stradley. And so I started picking up books and had it in my head at, to do this story sometime. We had talked to different people mm -hmm. to write it. But in the meantime, over the course of about, well, almost 30 years, uh, I've been to Japan a couple, several dozen times and uh, visited the temple, uh, burned incense at all the graves, gone to Kira's, what's left of Kira's house, traveled the route that he mm -hmm. traveled, stood. We will. <laughs> we'll get to him, yeah. And. Uh, um, That's our editor. She's always yeah. hurrying us along. So you're late, you're late. <laughs> She's been doing that to me for 25 years, I just have to say. Anyway. Uh, so we're going to show some slides in here, and we're going to show some of the art. And along the way, there was an artist that uh, I, part of the research that we did, mm -hmm. uh, there was an artist that was influential also in sort of picking the style that we, mm -hmm. Stan wanted to, to uh, do this in. And I had acquired all this uh, material over the course of 30 years. So yeah, when, when you, yeah, we talked, and I told, I told you, oh, yeah, I've got um, eight variations of the story on DVD. And yeah. you said, oh, I've got a dozen. Yeah. Well, I, I've got all the movies. Yeah. There's dozens of movies and television series yeah. and books. And this story is told yeah. over and over and There's over in one 12-hour version. Yes. So, wow. Yeah. Uh, the first, I think the first film was the 1940, 41 film mm -hmm. that actually was interrupted by the war and mm -hmm. then finished later in the war. And I th it has the least amount of action. It's probably the most historically mm -hmm. Uh, accurate, uh, but it's the most famous of them. But there's every, yeah. you know, and then later on they did versions where uh, they needed a star in it, so Toshiro Mifune yeah. would show up three times on a bridge and it had nothing to do yeah. with the story, but he, they <laughs> could put his name up at the front of it. So uh, anyway, so why don't we start putting some of the slides. Uh, this is the, the trade that's coming out, the, the complete book. Um, that's the cover for mm -hmm. it. And this is the conversation that it refers to, just so you know. <laughs> okay. okay, well, the first story, um, I sent Stan one of my, re uh, part of the research I did. Mm -hmm. uh, that, this is uh, the statement, to know this story is to know Japan. It's also, uh, there's a traditional symbolism between the samurai and the cherry tree. Mm -hmm. So one of the things Stan got was a cherry tree. <laughs> And that was a yeah. pretty much a motif throughout the entire uh, first issues. Yes. Uh, there's always uh, cherry blossoms or cherry trees around. Yeah, it's, it's uh, throughout the story, yeah. and it has a special significance to the samurai about mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the uh, transitory nature yeah, of life. How fleeting life yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, how fleeting life is. Beautiful, and then it's gone. Uh, by the way, there's a, if you pick up the book, there's a number of... Uh, there's a number of uh, very obscure, uh, oh, Japanese cust custom references and little items all through the book. And for the Japanese historians and you, those of you who know Japanese culture will be able to find some of them. This is the artist that I worked with right there. And you may not know who it is, but. <laughs> That's the cover for the next uh, collection. That comes out when, July? 
And this, it will have an introduction by George Takei, Mr. Sulu. I'm really happy for that. I've kind of known George, or acquainted with George for about oh, 15 years or so, but I have never gotten an oh my from him. <laughs> Now, I have to point out, you'll notice up on the top of that, it says uh, National Cartoonist Society Award winner. So that you know, very few comic artists, comic book artists, have ever been brought into the National Cartoonist Society. It was very elitist in its early yeah. years, and only newspaper uh, cartoonists, uh, the people who did the Sunday strips. For those of you who don't know, uh, before television, uh, <laughs> way back then, the, the newspaper was people's primary uh, source of information, and uh, it wasn't the best uh, news reporter like mm -hmm. you might see in the movies or anything like that that sold newspapers. Uh, most of the big cities yeah. had multiple newspapers. What sold the newspaper was the comic yeah, strip. Right. Now, these days, the only person I can think of who's as famous and as, became as famous and as financially successful as those newspaper strip artists back then is maybe Charles Schultz. Yeah. Uh, we all know Peanuts, even though it, he's been gone for a while, which shows his staying power and the influence he had on our society. But in those days, there were a hundred Charles Schultz. There yeah. was Hal Foster and Alex Raymond and Milton Kniff and Chester Cap, Gould yeah. and Al Cap, and every one of them was famous to the public. They were very famous people because the comic strip is what sold the newspaper. In fact, in the old days, and they still do it in some cities, I say the old days, before we were alive, by the way, we're not talking to you <laughs> about this because we were there, but in the old days, they used to wrap the Sunday paper around the, uh, or wrap the Sunday paper with the comic strips, and you still see that somewhere, and that's because each city had three, two, three, and sometimes more if it was New York or something, newspapers. So what sold that newspaper, if you, Little Orphan Annie was number one, They'd wrap Little Orphan Annie, the number one strip, they'd wrap it on the outside of the newspaper and then they'd outsell their rivals. So they were huge. So National Cartoonist Society was uh, created to honor those people, these famous and talented and very financially successful people. Uh, people who did comic books were looked down upon. They usually end up... Uh, uh, dying in the basement yeah. of churches and stuff. <laughs> yeah. and that's not an exaggeration. These are taken right from... Uh, by the way, there's a history of comics you can read about this called uh, Between the Panels uh, that's available in your local bookstore. Uh -huh. Who's the author? Uh, well, somebody here <laughs> on this panel, actually. Anyway, um, they were looked down upon. So it's very rare mm -hmm. that... It's been very rare that yeah. someone gets the honor. So this is a long way of saying describing what an honor it is for Stan to be invited into that exclusive well, group. Well, there's a hierarchy. There was the newspaper cartoonists, there was a gag cartoonists, like for magazines, and comic books were way at the bottom. Yeah, but it's still, there are not many uh, yeah. over the years. Yeah. Uh, this is, we put some, this is uh, uh, Sengakuji, mm -hmm. the temple. Uh, where the Ronin brought his uh, head to, and where the Ronin are buried, the 47 are buried. By the way, they didn't consider themselves Ronin because a Ronin is a masterless samurai, and they still considered Asano uh, their, as their master. They were still in service of him through that whole time. So they're called the 47 Ronin, but they considered themselves in the service of their master. So, so that's the front. This is the well, yeah. what's left of it, where they uh, presented. Uh, well, they washed the head. Washed the head, yeah. Didn't present it, that's yeah. right. They washed it to put in front, they presented mm -hmm. it to Uishi. This is a statue of Uishi, uh, the, the uh, uh, chief uh, retainer for Asano. And that's the symbol. Mm -hmm. his, uh, his, the mon, his yeah. clan crest. Which I was, I was glad that it was very simple. <laughs> yeah, well, why don't you talk about the clan crests and uh -huh. the, how you handle those in the book? Yeah, uh, because it's a historical story, I tried to get the clan crest uh, as accurate as I could. Uh, Oishi's was easy because he was very prominent, but uh, other characters uh, had different clan crests according to which clan they were and which sides of the uh, faction they were, whether they were part of uh, uh, Asano's clan or, because even Asano's clan had different clan crests, um, or which, which would uh, be other clan crests. Uh, I tried to be as accurate as possible, uh, but still, it's, it was very hard uh, trying to figure out 
which uh, character belong with which clan, uh, which clan, which crest I could use, which ones I should not use, and so that that was a problem. It took it took about three three months to research everything, and even uh, Oishi. Um, if you look at the statue, the way he looks is he's a bit pudgy. Whereas, so I went to a more traditional heroic uh, figure of uh, Oishi, where he's uh, tall and he's very regal and he has a uh, you know, big nose. And <laughs> but um, yeah, so it was that's an artist's yeah. interpretation. Yeah, anyway, that's true. You know, yeah, so. but I tried to make it was a deliberate change in the character, uh, the appearance of the character, just to make him a bit more. Heroic. Mm -hmm. And when you couldn't figure out the correct, the accurate research mm -hmm. press, you. Do you want to come up here, Diana? <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? What? Did I make some up? <laughs> I probably made it up. Down in the bottom corner, <laughs> uh, the white building you mm -hmm. see, uh, the corrupt official, mm -hmm. uh, Kira. That's what's left of his house. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been changed and remodeled. That's outside. There's a stone outside talking about it. Obviously, uh, it, it was originally built in, well, mm -hmm. the incident happened in 1702, so the neighborhood does not look the mm -hmm. same. But that's part of, there's part of the original house. The courtyard, I believe, is what's left of the original mm -hmm. house. And before they attacked, before they, uh, and it used to have a, uh, fence surrounding the whole grounds. And before they attacked, Oishi asked, actually sent one of the Ronin to the neighbors to knock yeah. on the door and tell them, this is a private matter. We mean you no harm. We're about to take care of a situation here, and we'd like you to just stay in your house and not, you won't be harmed. Yeah. And so they went out and sort yeah. of gave that warning to everyone uh, in the neighborhood. And all the neighbors yeah, complied. Yeah, I mean, well. they, they didn't run to Shogun and say, hey, you know, these guys are attacking Lord Kira. Yeah. They, they, they kept in the houses and kept out of it. So. Yeah. Uh, this is a grave site where the, the uh, Ronin are buried. Uh, Japanese bur burial is a little more uncomfortable than our burial. They don't get laid out. Mm. They actually get sort of folded up. Yeah. It's in a round uh, casket. Like an urn or yeah. something, yeah. Anyway, the, uh, uh, you can burn incense. Now, uh, Stan having Japanese background, I just have to say, he burned incense at some of the graves. But I just want you to know I burned it at every single one of those graves. <laughs> so uh, I, I did, I'm just pointing that out, Stan. But anyway, that, this is a grave site. Mm -hmm. I think we have uh, some more. That's Oishi's uh, site right yeah. there, I believe where the head was presented. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, they all look pretty much the same. It's 47. Mm -hmm. There is a 48th grave yeah. there. We'll talk about that yeah. story a little later. Now, one of the research things I sent to Stan at mm -hmm. the museum in, uh, and you'll see uh, this when is Stan. The Tokyo Edo Museum, yeah. Yeah, yeah. at the museum, they have literally rebuilt the whole cities. They're, yeah. they're small, but they cover a tremendous area. And you can literally, this is uh, 18th century life in Japan. So I took extensive photos of that for reference yeah. for when, whenever someday we did the story. By the way, the reason that I, you might wonder, we waited all these years to do this amazing story that I, you know, I was just fascinated with and kept thinking about doing it. But what pushed me to doing it and getting this out quickly because you may have heard there's a 47 Ronin movie coming out. Now there's dragons and mm -hmm. uh, the monsters witch. and mm -hmm. a witch and uh, <laughs> evil spirits and that that are not historical. I have zero to do with this. <laughs> Second, if a gaijin uh -huh. were to wash up on the shore of Japan in 1701 and expect to uh, um, lead any, well, if he was expected anything except mm -hmm. to be killed, he would, uh, he would have been very disillusioned or very have a mm -hmm. fooling himself, excuse me. Anyway, so uh, the movie is about uh, Keanu Reeves washing up and leading the 47 Ronin, which is more preposterous than the dragon mm -hmm. in the. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so here's more uh, scenes, and you can see how realistic they're down to the tiniest yeah. detail, including the, the uh, mm -hmm. clan symbols yeah. and the painting on the inside walls of the home when you can look in the windows, yeah. the, everything is absolute 
incredible. And they had some cutaways that you, you can see uh, how the, uh, the ceilings are put together or inside the roofs. It's just an amazing place. If I remember, I'm trying to remember this particular picture because there's, I had hundreds of them. I think this is the Shogun's Palace. This is mm -hmm. what this is. Yes. Uh, you know, the, these buildings would be what, maybe yeah. about that high? Yeah. And then you'd it, see the figures yeah. that high. And it just, you can see how big this is. Look in the top. Yeah. They're just. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a big area. It's, yeah. yeah. So I, if those of you who have interest in Japanese culture, going to the museum yeah. is a must. It's just yeah. so amazing. You'll spend an entire day there, or, and you may go back for a second day. Uh, they actually have some life-size versions of these that you yeah. can actually go into and sort of be inside, and it's set up just like, uh, just like uh, you would find. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so one of our spiritual leader on this was uh, Kazuo Kuike. Uh, I don't know if you know who Kuike is, but he's uh, the writer of many, many manga, uh, most famous uh, Lone Wolf and Cub, or the Baby Cart series. Mm -hmm. um, he... Uh, I, I tried to get the rights to this for about 10 years and finally got a meeting with him and we became friends after that. Um, Kuike, much, if you know about samurai, they uh, used to build their, uh, the, the process of creating a sword mm -hmm. was a very serious yeah. uh, business. Uh, Kuike, years later, in his uh, uh, old studio had golf club makers. <laughs> <laughs> who made golf clubs in much the same way. Each one was made personally. He'd use them, and then he'd sell them. And he even told me there's a stroke, there's a particular stroke with the samurai of all the hundreds, of, because each stroke actually had a name. And there was a stroke with the golf club that very much was similar to a stroke with, uh, uh, with the sword, with a, a samurai stroke with the sword. And I asked him, so are you telling me that all of this is some modern way of you uh, somehow emulating the samurai? Mm -hmm. And he said, could be. <laughs> <laughs> That's as far as he would go. But anyway, he's a very famous writer. And I felt as uh, writing this story, and this was before I'd even approached mm -hmm. Stan, which when I was first writing it, that because I, you know, Gaijin, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't really mean that, but it's from the old, old Japan, and I guess mm -hmm. the best non-literal translation mm -hmm. would be unkempt barbarian. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. was this. That's not the strict uh, yeah. translation. But I felt like this is so uh, such a precious story in Japan that a gaijin writing it needed to have mm -hmm. someone on it to make sure that uh, sort of gave yeah. it authenticity. So. Uh, Kuike actually was excited about me about me doing it because he's been a proponent in Japan about uh, uh, Japan's content reaching out and spreading around the world with the government. He works with the government mm -hmm. also. Japan's a very small island. They don't have many resources. The one resource that they can put uh, create and that they're very good at creating, and if you've watched manga or anime on television, all the films and mm -hmm. everything coming out of Japan, the one thing they can do is content. Mm -hmm. So he, had, he was the one who went to the government and said, this is, we should be promoting artists and writers because this is how we can have our effect on the world and this is how we can export material. I said import, I think mm -hmm. I meant export. Uh, Japan can export this material all over the world and uh, uh, be very successful doing it. And as you've seen, Japan exports many, many uh, intellectual properties and ideas that uh, find a home here in the United mm -hmm. States. So he was our sort of our spiritual guide. Uh, as I was doing my research, I'll mm -hmm. let, I talk, talking too much, but I, as I uh, was researching, I found an art, artist by the name of Agato Gecko who I wanted to mm -hmm. uh, use as sort of, he, as the, uh, what the uh, visual guide mm -hmm. to how the series looks. So I sent that to Stan. Yeah. And Stan Actually, you that uh, figure on the on the uh, the left there with him uh, lifting up the the uh, the painting to find the the hidden passage is what I based yeah. uh, that scene upon. He did wood uh, woodcuts. He yeah. lived uh, what 1860 to 1920, mm -hmm. some, something like that. 
And that's actually them searching in Kira's yeah. house for, uh, or searching in Kira's house for uh, Kira. He yeah. was hidden. There was a hidden passage in the house. But so I sent those to Stan yeah. and mm -hmm. said, you know, here's, uh, here's sort of the woodblock mm -hmm. style. And so. Yeah, I know mainly as a funny animal artist, so drawing people, uh, I mean, pe uh, readers, readers were not used to that. But I, gained my, I got my inspiration from the old Japanese woodcuts, including Gecko. His name's Ogata Gecko. You can look him up on the internet. Amazing artist. Yeah. In fact, I, and you can buy his pieces, his original signed pieces. I just uh, had my assistant look up, and you can buy them for like $200, which is amazing. Yeah. So I ordered several of them. But they're, they're amazing pieces. So his name's Ogata mm -hmm. Gecko, mm -hmm. G-E-K-K-O. So if you put 47 Ronin, if you Google it and put Gecko mm -hmm. after, you can see his work. There's yeah. whole, British Museum has a complete mm. uh, 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 list of all his uh, work. These are more of the Ronin yeah. prints. Yeah, I like that it took place in the winter time, the, the final fighting. So with the snow on the ground and everything. It, December, they, yeah. they made the attack in December and uh, snow was on mm -hmm. the ground and they marched from, from uh, Kira's house carrying the head mm -hmm. and word spread so fast that people lined, lined the roads up, to yeah. see them walking uh, along the road and, mm -hmm. and word about this uh, yeah. amazing thing that had been done. Well, there are people waiting for that. It's like, you know, so when are they going to do this? Yeah. Why aren't? Why didn't they? Why take didn't revenge? they do something? In fact, uh, even after the fact, uh, they were criticized for waiting so long. In case, well, what if you were waiting and uh, Kira had died during that time? Yeah, but yeah. That's a great point yeah. because uh, they took a big risk. Yeah, they did. Because if Kira, in the over a year that they waited, if Kira would have died of a heart attack yeah. or something, they could have never. They yeah. would have been disgraced forever, and they could have never. Um, explain, no, yeah. no, no, we're, this was yeah. really our plan. It would have never worked. So they took a big yeah. risk in waiting. But they had the choice of attacking then and then being wiped out and never achieving their goal or waiting and you know attacking at their That's convenience. Right. And they're always being watched by the government and by Kita's uh, spies. So if they did anything, like gather, to, uh, you know, about three of, three of them would gather, Kita would know about it yeah. and would know that they're going to be um, uh, you know, pl they're planning something. They had to. They had to do. Uh, they had to be very secretive yeah. and meet in very secret yeah. places outside of Edo. And mm -hmm. the, the, to show you the links that they'd go to, one of the Ronin married the daughter of the architect who built Kira's house, so that when they yeah. came to the house, they knew they knew how it was laid out, knew just where to go and just where mm -hmm. Kira's room was, yeah. and all of that. Uh -huh. And Oishi, uh, the head of the Ronin, I mean, not only be, did he pretend to be a drunkard and everything, but he divorced his wife. He, you know, he pretty much degraded himself. The wife he himself. loved, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah he degraded himself. Yeah. Uh, lived with a, pro moved yeah. in with a prostitute, mm -hmm. uh, fell down drunk in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, was allowed himself to be spit upon in the street, which is, for a samurai, that was mm -hmm. the worst insult you yeah. could take. But we're, we're going to talk about mm -hmm. that in just a moment. Uh, the other thing about the, the controversy about the 47 Ronin is um, to be strict Bushido code, and Kuike made mm -hmm. sure that I, we, we kept this in the book. Strict Bushido code says that you have to, uh, it's loyalty and honor and uh, uh, carrying on in a, a certain way, but revenge is mm -hmm. about yourself yeah. and is not Bushido code. Yeah. So it's always caused a little bit of controversy about their motives, whether it was true Bushido code or not. But Kuiko said there's definitely revenge mm -hmm. involved in their attack. It wasn't just to restore the honor. He said, you must know that there was mm -hmm. revenge. They, they wanted him. So that's created a controversy over the years, over the mm -hmm. centuries about this story. So Stan used uh, the stuff, so you should talk oh, about this. Oh, this is uh, Sengakuji uh, Temple, and it's in the middle of Tokyo. And you know, 
as I said, this is taken from my photographs, so some of my uh, own research, and I'm just so glad that, <laughs> that I took a lot of uh, yeah. pictures. It's the place you saw me standing yeah. in front of in one of the photographs. Mm -hmm. Still looks yeah. like it did yeah. one time, but you, that was uh, re reinterpreting mm -hmm. how the landscape was. Mm -hmm. I just took away all the buildings, the tall buildings in the background. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the Toyota building. And the car that was parked right yeah. over there in my uh, drawing, or yeah, in my that's photograph. Question there? Uh, what are those branches or uh, those forks? Yes, uh, on, on the trees, it's pretty common in uh, Japan where you have uh, supports for branches or especially old trees. And, uh, you know, when we went to um, uh, Kyomizu Dera in uh, Kyoto, and they have pine trees that are really expansive, and they have all these supports holding up the branches, and it's really nice. Like, it's it's pretty cool. And those those supports were there when I was there, so I just included them in the uh, in the drawing. In, in the background, in the back there. Why the story of tensors for so long? The uh, shogun controlled uh, all of the information, and particularly in this story, when it happened. They wanted to uh, control everything mm -hmm. about what went out about it. Mm -hmm. The shogun was put in an uncomfortable position because after the incident, the uh, 47 became heroes. I mean, the story spread instantly all over Japan, and they became heroes, and these, uh, these uh, stout devotees of the Bushido Code. And, um, and at that time, the story was important because there was no war going on at that time, and samurai Samurai warriors were, that's what they were. They were yeah. there, they were, it's the way of the warrior. That's basically what samurai means. And uh, there's no war, so they were becoming corrupted. Mm -hmm. They were becoming, uh, they were, their standards were getting loose. So this story in the middle of the, uh, that time period where these ronin were so willing to sacrifice their own life mm -hmm. to honor their master and restore his name, uh, the shogun was put in this uncomfortable yeah. position because by drawing his sword in, in the uh, shogun's uh, palace, he was, the shogun felt forced yeah. to apply the law yeah. because if he didn't, he'd be, look weak and look like, so he, with these heroes over here, and yet because they defied him and didn't put down their weapons, yeah. he was in a bad position in public opinion. So obviously uh, he wanted to control all the information coming out. And this particular shogun uh, was a little crazy anyway. So Nayoshi, yeah. Yeah. He, uh, for instance, there was, uh, you couldn't kill an animal. Well, he was he, called, nicknamed the dog shogun because he had, he had a dream uh, that, about dogs, and dogs are nice. So he put out a decree saying, anyone who mistreats a dog will be put to death as they have stories of all these stray dogs wandering around Edo and... Um, Which, by the way, you see a stray dog So whenever I there. did out in exterior scene, I always put at least one dog in there. Yeah. Just because, and you know, we didn't mention it in the story, but it's just part of uh, the um, history back then. That's, uh, if you see this, yeah. those kinds of things are spread yeah. throughout the book. Yeah. Just. And I did take a lot of liberties with the artwork, such as this. Uh, the Shogun's uh, uh, palace is pretty much the castle, the walls, and it's empty all around uh, for about a hundred yards or so. I did put buildings in there uh, mainly because uh, for the uh, visual effect. And I know it really wasn't like that, but um, I, I just wanted the, uh, the uh, town there as well as the, the palace. And I tried to get the, uh, the castle as accurate as possible and I was doing all these research, and then I found out, oh, it's been burned down three times <laughs> since that time. So then it, it, a lot of the pressure was taken off of me. But I did get things like the uh, certain gates that was important. I did put. And it needs to be pointed out that these are historically accurate yeah. buildings, even if they are not yeah. the buildings. Mm -hmm. This is what they might have yeah. looked like. Yes. Yes. Fifty years. Yeah. The first Kabuki play. Right. And in yeah. your research, how far back in terms of authentic documents were you guys able to go to research the story? Well, there's, there were, it was talked about and people knew the story yeah. and it was passed around. So it was around. The first written version yeah. of it, uh, official written version of it, was like 75 years later yeah. uh, because of the censorship. Yeah. 
And so, there's, yeah, there was only one written eyewitness account to the, uh, the drawing of the sword. And it just said that uh, Lord Asana drew his sword against Lord Kida and yelled, I have a grudge. That's right. That's it. And there were all kinds of, over the years, there's all kinds of versions. Some people will say, well, this happened and that happened. The truth is nobody knows yeah. for sure what happened inside the palace. They don't I know. I was frankly surprised. Like I said, I, I've known the story since I was in the third grade, but I was surprised at how much of it is factual, how much of it is speculation, and how much of it is just outright fabrication. Yeah. So I was, I was Because of the surprised. Kabuki plays, because yeah. they, they didn't have all the, so each uh, author would mm -hmm. create his own version of the story. What they do know is Asano was called to the Shogun's palace. Inside there, something happened between Asano and Kira. He pulled his sword and probably struck Kira that his uh, lands and life were forfeited. And sometime later, 47 Ronin attacked Kira's place, killing yeah. all the men. They let the women and children, of course, mm -hmm. go, but killed all of the men and took Kira's head in the courtyard. Yeah. That's and they said. have documentation, such as the, the uh, Sengakuji has the receipt for Kira's head right. when it was claimed by Kira's. You can uh, go and see yeah. this stuff. Yeah. By the way, it has their original armor yeah. there. Oh, yeah. They have a museum there. If you go to the temple, you can see the original armor that they built, made themselves because they yeah. didn't dare buy it because that would have given them away. Mm -hmm. So they actually, this crude army, mm -hmm. they built it or made it themselves. Oh, that's Lord Asano, I, uh, who is being kicked in the face. Um, and. I think at first he, you had uh, written out, oh, he gets slapped, but I s had suggested, oh, have him be kicked because the bottom the, of the, the foot, the foot yeah. it's dirty, and that's a really big insult. And you know, you're really, it was really great working with you in that you're very receptive to my ideas and suggestions. Yeah. Well, uh, Stan, the foot was Stan's idea of actually showing the foot having struck mm -hmm. his face because for a samurai, I guess the only thing worse would have been spitting, yeah, you know, because yeah. they took these things as grave mm -hmm. insults worthy of death, you know, and um, by Stan putting that, it really ex it showed why he mm -hmm. actually attacked him. If you saw the uh, some of the re the slides we showed earlier of the. Uh, this is what it reminded me of, yeah. the, the recreations of the... Just well, the, each um, chapter, I think, hit, opened up with a full page big splash. Full page, yeah. So I tried to di do different perspectives, and uh, I like the crows. Crows are great, Crows, yeah. yeah. Again, a full page splash. And I like the weather, the seasons and things, so, you know, following these and mm -hmm. trying to get the seasons as appropriate as I can. We, Laverne did a wonderful yeah. job on the oh, colors. Oh, yeah, the yeah. colors. Uh, L Laverne Konzerski did the colors. And again, trying to evoke that uh, mm -hmm. uh, woodcut, yeah. woodblock uh, art. Um, this particular scene we put in there because it was, uh, I thought it was important to make the Ronin not these faceless uh, uh, samurai that were going to come out of the nowhere. We, mm -hmm. we wanted to take a certain few of them and yeah. sort of Give show they had out. lives. So we put a, a love story that's involved of a samurai who has to um, walk away from mm -hmm. the, his fiance and literally for honor and for Bushido has to turn his back on her. And there's a touching mm -hmm. uh, moment at the end mm -hmm. where she comes to him before he commits uh, seppuku yeah. and pleads with him because she's pregnant, yeah. and pleads with him to throw her himself on and the And I show. don't know why I did it, but the last uh, scene there, I had her as a little mermaid in, um, <laughs> on the rock in Denmark. <laughs> yeah. Just by the way. Just by the way. Also, I put myself in, in the story as one of the Ronins. Yeah. You probably don't know. It's the one wearing the Usagi, uh, little Usagi heads on his uh, kimono. By the way, I, I just I've pointed out to Stan that his Usagi work, now that he's gone to it, looks much more detailed <laughs> and much more uh, realistic these days. So I'm. Again, trying to do different perspectives and just uh, making the uh, shots look interesting. 
because a lot of the opening scenes have, in, have to do with um, uh, settings. And most of the settings do take place in houses or courtyards and such. And uh, I just want to get different perspectives and uh, different techniques in it. I, I like the trees in this one. Well, this so accurately gives the mm. feel of uh, life in Japan yeah. at that time. And uh, it was important, uh, the locations were extremely important to the story yeah, itself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Stan's done such a wonderful yeah. job. I mean, you can see the amazing work he yeah. did on this book. Yeah, I like little touches with the different tiles and the, the pine tree in the background that's uh, covered with the, um, the straw, the straw matting. I thought that, I, I'm never sure why they did it, but it looks really cool. This is Oishi, and he left the city life and became a farmer for a while. This is before he divorced his wife. You can see the spy. Yeah. He was being spied on all the time. So uh, uh, this is just before, he, I think he asked, uh, one of the samurai comes to him and tells him that uh, they had a petition to restore the lands. Uh, one of the things, Asano was uh, forced to commit seppuku, and because he was a person of honor, they usually had an investigation, but he was forced to immediately commit seppuku, uh, and, and they didn't have that investigation, mm -hmm. so they put a... Uh, Oishi's hope was that they could petition the shogun and get some justice for yeah. Asano, and this is a scene where uh, one of the... Uh, Ronan come yeah. to him and tell him that... Also, uh, they're hoping that Asan Asano's cousin or something right. could take over the clan. That's right, and, and carry on the name yeah. so that honor would be restored. Yeah. And then they wouldn't have to go yeah. any farther if that happened. They could have stopped there. And this is, I, I yeah. believe, where he came and told them that the petition had been yeah. turned down. And this is Oishi, yeah, and Oishi the debauchery. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the top scene is a brothel, the, uh, the, from the shot from the interior of the brothel. And uh, Oishi's uh, outside there looking in with the, uh, the jug of uh, sake on his, slung over his back. You have to understand, Oishi was an extremely proud man. So for him to do this and allow himself to be seen this way had to have been uh, very painful for him, excruciating, because he was violating yeah. everything he believed in in order to draw attention away from himself. Again, Laverne did such a wonderful job on the first panel. That's exactly the way I wanted it to be, and you know, he pulled it off great. Like, the, the foreground would be in shadows, like you're in the building, and Oishi in the background would be lighted up like he's outside. So he and I thought it was amazing how I wrote these so, so perfectly that Stan could write it or draw it exactly the way I wanted it. <laughs> I'm just no. That's not true. No, I, I, I liked your uh, script. It was, I've never worked with a full scripts before, which you supplied, and it was great because I could just thumbnail the, uh, the page on, on the back of the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> so when I sent the uh, artwork to Diana, it's like with the, um, the thumbnails would be on the back of the boards. Yeah, the, uh, actually, uh, we did five, uh, how many pages? Where's Diana? How many pages did it end up? Uh, like total? Yeah. About a hundred and some pages, yeah. but there's so much we could have told. There's so yeah. much of all the legend. I had to cut probably about, 30 pages out of my outline. I just had to keep cutting it down so it was mad. The story was manageable. Uh, yeah, were these colors done digitally or were this by hand? Uh, Laverne, uh, digital. digitally. Digital. Yeah. <coughs> And we also used an off-white paper in the, in the pu printing, our publishing. Uh, uh, well, kind of. It was off. It wasn't uh, the glossy white. The uh, an interesting thing about Gecko was uh, um, he was a woodblock artist. And he tried to do, he was the first one to try and 
make it look as though his uh, um, uh, pages were uh, painted, hand painted. Mm -hmm. So when you look at his prints, they look hand painted. He even would put, you could almost see strokes in them, but it's all wood, woodblock prints. Oh, this is when um, the samurai from Setsuma, uh, Satsuma uh, takes Oishi's sword and spits on him. Oishi's on the ground, he's drunk, he's fallen down in the mud, and you know, very, very disgraced. So when he spits on him, so, and he, yeah, he takes his short sword mm -hmm. from him. He says he doesn't have, he's a disgrace as a samurai. And this is based on another legend. Actually, it could be more than le legend because mm -hmm. there's a name of a family that claims uh, that we found in the research that claims that that was part of his ancestor. Yeah. But when you approached me with this uh, idea, one of my first questions was, do you know about the 48th samurai or the 48th row, just to test him? And he, Mike said, that's who's telling the story. And I thought, my gosh, that is genius. <laughs> There's been like what, about 108 variations or uh, DVDs or um, retelling of a story, but it, that, has ne that approach has never been done. And that was just a stroke of genius. So right then on board, I, you know, I, was, I was on board. So. <laughs> Sorry to have tested you, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I passed it. <laughs> anyway, so if you, next. Oh, this is uh, Osano's wife, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Osano came just when they decided they were going to make their strike against Kira. He came and uh, there's a traditional stone in Japanese culture that mm -hmm. to give honor to the people who have passed. And he came to Osano's widow and asked if he could um, pay, pay his respects to Osano's stone. And she angrily threw him out, basically, yeah. because he said, you didn't, uh, you, you're a disgrace, you did not honor my husband, you didn't keep your word to him. So he politely gave him a ledger and left. Yeah. Well, in the ledger was every cent that had been spent yeah. from Asano's money preparing for this attack, and she realized after he left mm -hmm. that he was planning to honor it, and then she was heartbroken because she realized this man she had just yeah. thrown out. She refused to have him burn incense at, right, at the stone. stone yeah. mm -hmm. So it was another one of those moments that I think when people hear the legend, it's just, it's just so important to know what these people went through. Oh, the nighttime scene. Again, a dog in the foreground. But uh, I, loved, I loved drawing weather, you know, uh, Usagi and weather and with the wind blowing or the snow uh, coming down. And, I thought it was great because it took place in the winter time. So. And Tokyo doesn't get snow every year. Yeah. So this was um, a year of snow, so that was neat. What was the bleakness? It was, yeah. What's so good is the bleakness of the weather was the same as mm -hmm. the day. They knew they were, by doing this, you know, he gave them multiple chances to back down. They didn't. Uh, some had, at the very beginning, mm -hmm. like I say, he had over 200 uh, uh, originally retainers, uh, yeah. retainers. So these 47 he gave several chances and thinned mm -hmm. it down till I got to these and then none of them um, uh, backed down. They yeah. were all in. Also I had asked you um, about the costumes for the Ronin. Do you want, did you want me right. to go with the, um, the traditional black that they actually wore or do you want me to do the kabuki version right. where it's a bit more elaborate? And you said no, do the historical one. Right. So I'm right. glad you told me to right. do that. And they still have the, the clothing. Yeah, they say yeah. you can go to the temple, yeah. See the weapons and uh, the drum, they banged the drum. Uh, Oishi gave a command for uh, Kira, told him why he was there and told him to come out. The drum was the signal also for the Ronin at the back of the mm -hmm. building to, because uh, they came in from both directions, from in the front and back, and actually put archers on the roof. Yeah. And when they tried to send uh, out for help, the archers would pick them off one by one as they tried to yeah. leave. They were going after uh, Ki to alert Kilo's uh, brother-in-law. Right. And actually, three of the um, Kilo's uh, men did make it. 
But I, I think the brother-in-law said, well, we'll hold off a, a bit. <laughs> I think in the story I killed those three, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I let one get yeah. away. Oh, you let one get away, that's right. Uh, we wanted another thing, too. To, this wasn't the typical movie. I want, mm. We wanted to have one scene in here where the, the, ro the, the retainers in Kira's house, I mean, they all died honorably. Mm -hmm. They weren't like bad guys or anything. And there's a lot of uh, historical evidence that says Kira wasn't a altogether bad yeah. guy, that, that Asano wasn't, uh, because he was from the country, wasn't observing court uh, mm -hmm. etiquette. So uh, Kira wasn't necessarily insulting him, but was insulted because Asano mm -hmm. didn't know how to properly act. But, uh, you know, we, we presented the story in a, a specific light, but we wanted to show that as, as people died honorably and uh, they, they knew it. It wasn't a uh, good guys and bad guys thing. It was a cultural thing that required them to mm -hmm. act a certain way and required the others to act a certain way. And here's a fine kira hidden in the, um, I guess it's the charcoal hut. It's a building. Uh, just on the side of, in the courtyard. Yeah, he's hidden in a hut uh, under something yeah. or in something. And uh, they pulled him out and they gave him the opportunity to commit seppuku. Mm -hmm. And he refused. And in fact, he said, what are, you doing in, what are you doing here? Get out of my property. You know, obviously he's a property owner. Here these men mm -hmm. come to kill him. He said, stop, leave me alone, get out of here. And uh, they took that as cowardice. Uh, because they gave him the opportunity to do seppuku, and since they didn't, they uh, mm -hmm. they uh, killed him. And I don't think I. What's the next? I think slide? it's the next slide. Yeah, and I don't know. Did I put it in yeah, there? Yeah, I think you did. Because it was a gruesome business, and yeah. we showed it as a gruesome business, mm -hmm. cutting his head off. It's well, I you know, did it with taste. But it's a gru. <laughs> he did it with taste, but it takes a while, yeah. you know. He's so it wasn't just, whoosh, and yeah. then it was nice and clean. It was. Mm -hmm. It, it was a, there, you there see. And I think that's sort of, uh, mm -hmm. I think Stan really showed the horror of doing something like that. It, mm -hmm. It's not a, it wasn't a clean business. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, it was bad. And you see, uh, Uishi mm -hmm. is uh, spent. Yeah. If you look at him when it's done, it's, 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 uh, mm -hmm. Well, they're planning it was for a year or so. Yeah. You don't see anybody smile or anything. The people are, yeah. the Ronin are sort of uh, worn and in mm -hmm. shock and dr uh, drained by the experience also. Mm. Basically, this is where they brought his head mm -hmm. and they presented after they had washed it in the well, which is mm -hmm. a well-known part of the, the uh, the story, they cleaned it in the well that I showed early on the slides, and then they presented it to Ishii and burnt incense. incense. At this point, they were, uh, they had uh, completed their mission, but it wasn't complete until they uh, um, stood and faced yeah. the, uh, the, um, the law yeah. for what they had done. Because if they had begged for forgiveness or tried to uh, get out of what they knew was coming, that would have uh, undermine the whole thing about being Bushido because mm -hmm. then it would have been about revenge. Yeah. So for Bushido code, they're saying we did this as an honorable thing to restore our Lord's uh, honor and so we're willing to take whatever mm -hmm. comes with that. So they did not protest. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Oishi. Oishi who, yeah. He waited to make sure all 47 Ronin died honorably. He was the last to go, including his own son. And uh, they all went, uh, historically, they went without uh, mm -hmm. anyone objecting or, or they all went quietly and honorably to their death. And Oishi went last. He wanted mm -hmm. to make sure that no one tried to get out of it. And this is the end of our story. This is so that you know the story of the 48th Ronin. Mm -hmm. The man who spit on Oishi when he laid on his in the road and took his sword, or took his short sword, was the one telling the story. He had come to the temple. And what he did is he was so disgraced by realizing that he had spit on an honorable samurai, he, he felt that the only way he could atone for that mm -hmm. was to go to o Oishi's uh, grave and commit seppuku. Yeah, and he's buried with the, uh, 
the others. Yeah. And so there's 48 graves there. One, and they, he's the 48th Ronin who is buried there with the other 47 yeah. uh, to, to atone for him not having faith and dishonoring an honorable man. Yeah, it's a really powerful story. He was one of the best known in Japan. Yeah. And it's all right there yes. in that book. And by Mike Richardson when? and Stan Sakai, <laughs> yeah. right there. It comes out in February or March or something. Yeah, February. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we're handing these out, right? Yeah. Yes. But I, we would, uh, oh, sure, questions? That's how they took the yeah, door down. They, they knocked the doors in with those. Okay, so they didn't use them in fighting, right? No, no. no, no, no. That it was for the, the doors were uh, strong and, yeah. and uh, to prevent entry, and so they took these huge mallets and took turns pounding on it till the door gave way. Meanwhile, while that's being pounded, the, uh, in, the samurai in the inside were mm -hmm. waking up and grabbing their swords. They were in confusion. You want? Well, at that time, the uh, samurai class were in a uh, decline. The merchant class was uh, getting much stronger, the, um, and there weren't any wars. But this kind of revived the interest or the passion, because this represents what a samurai is. Samurai literally means one who serves. And these guys serve their lord to the utmost. I mean, loyalty and honor above all things. And, they epitomized what the, uh, the, uh, the code of Bushido, the code of samurai. And that, like Mike said, it was, this story was kind of repressed. Um, well, after the war, uh, this story was repressed by the, uh, the US um, because they didn't want this uh, story to be you know, uh, out there uh, in the occupied country. And, uh, but right after the, uh, the war, the occupation ended, then all these stories about the Ronin uh, started coming up, but there was a resurgence of that, both kabuki uh, films and everything. And yeah, it's one of the best known stories in Japanese history. The, uh, the samurai came to mean like way of the warrior, mm -hmm. but the original, the, what, the kanji mm -hmm. from Chinese, well before that's very similar mm -hmm. to the Japanese symbol for samurai, meant uh, one who serves. One who serves, yeah. And so that, that, that was sort of where the, it evolved out of. Yeah. And uh, people saw the noble, much like we do, we look at the Old West and we think of the gunfighter's mm -hmm. code and uh, how they lived by the code of the, uh, the Old West. Uh, Japanese people saw uh, an ideal mm -hmm. in the samurai, uh, honor, loyalty, um, um, a way to live one's life. Uh, and one of the reasons that the Samurai Code was so important, it was actually to, uh, uh, the code was to keep a control of the warrior class because otherwise they could have gone in diff different mm -hmm. directions. So by teaching this code and passing this code, which had uh, its roots in uh, Zen Buddhism, mm -hmm. uh, it was actually teaching a noble way to live an honorable way to live. And so people, I think we all naturally gravitate towards wanting to live an ideal life and wanting to live with honor. And like I say, during the war, during, uh, you'll see Japanese soldiers always carry those mm -hmm. swords. Well, the swords weren't very effective in no. war, but that was to remind them of the Bushido Code and to die with honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could very, could that, very that well be. I think it's probably true. <coughs> right, mm -hmm. right. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah, we'll yes.
Well, I, I personally, I didn't see the Bushido code as harsh. Yeah. I saw it as a high standard that someone mm -hmm. would uh, try to live up to. Um, again, Bushido code is about conduct and mm -hmm. honor. And in the Bushido code, uh, for instance, martial arts, you needed to become a master. Mm -hmm. That was all part of the samurai way of life. And you were trying to live up to a standard. So I guess the harshness would be what you would put yourself mm -hmm. through to hold on to your honor, but I think that's a, uh, that's, those are stories that human beings like yeah. to hear. It's the Alamo here, you know, I mean, it's like the closest where the legend is that they stood there and fought to the last for an ideal, for, for, a, for a dream, and that's yeah. much like a... And I think uh, we're about... Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so yeah. much. Okay.